Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning. Okay. Uh, let's turn our Bibles this morning to Psalm 28, verse 6 to 7. Psalm 28, verse 6 to 7. Even as you read the verses, uh, will you also um, reflect and even think about the times where God has heard your cries? Uh, God, when God um, hears you and um, how you've experienced Him to be your strength and your shield? And even as you read the verses, will you also take the time to thank him for how you have encountered him to be so? In Psalm 28, verse 6 to 7, it says, Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise him. So in this psalm, we see David's posture of praise, prayer, and his response to God, one that is of trust and confidence in who he is. and how he recognized that God is the one who hears him, who hears him when he pours out his heart to him, how he's the God who strengthened him and who carries him through every season of his life, and how he is the God who is the one who shield him and protect him, not just in the physical sense, but even in the spiritual way where the evil one would plant, would plant doubts and fears into his mind. Perhaps in this time, David has yet to be delivered from his difficult situation. Yet he chose to trust in God, recognizing that God is the one who can help him. And in response, David heart leaps for joy. And with his song, he prays God. Let us pray. Dear God, we love to worship you this morning like the confidence that David has in you in all situations. We know you always hear us when we cry out to you. And for that, God, you are worthy of all praise. You are our strength for your support and carry us through every season of our life. You are our shield who protects us. Our hearts trust in you, in your power and promises. Our heart rejoice, and with our songs we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. So church, let us stand.
Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. So church, no matter what we are going through, we continue to depend on him. Let prayer and praise be our way.
look to you. We want to choose to rejoice, to choose to praise you. We remember that you are the one who hears our cries. You hear us. You always hear us. And surely all praise goes to you. In whichever season of life that we might be in, God, you are our confidence. We have confidence in who you are, God, that you are the one whom we can place our trust in. You are our strength and our shield. And surely, God, our heart leap for joy. And with our songs, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. come to the segment of our worship through tithes and our offerings and you know during the period of COVID sometimes in the instruction is we can't pass the offering back uh, now as we have post went through the COVID uh, this this part of our worship is very significant as we bring an offering and our tithes to the Lord I'd like to prepare us to give to the Lord through a portion of scripture I'm taken from Hebrews chapter 11 um, by faith the scripture says Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. And by faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings, his giving to the Lord. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. You see, what people of God, one of the significant things as you think about offering, especially when we have went through the book of Leviticus, the offering is in itself a symbolic, a very significant representation of the offering of our heart and more so what we believe who God is. The offering of praise is most acceptable. The offering of our tithes and giving is most acceptable when our offering is by faith, as the scripture says, by faith. So you realize that in the Bible, God says that God desires that our offering will be one that is faith-filled by faith. And to help us even better understand when God says desires faith-filled offering, He simply means that our offering should be representative of what we believe who God is. So think about that for a short while because we can easily give our tithes to whatever percentage that you have believed, to trust Lord, but it should be a representation of what you believe God is. It's a faith-filled giving to you because I trust and I know you will provide. So let us consider this very simple text as we take time now to give an offering to the Lord. If you have not done so for the month, for the week, our offering must be one that is of faith and must reveal whom that we trust. Amen? So I, let us take that time, even as you have given, just to meditate on this scripture. And for the rest of us, if you have not given, I'm going to encourage you to take the time now. Uh, moving forward, so this screen will be presented. You could give your tithes in two ways, one of which is very e tithes This is not unfamiliar to most of us. Um, but be careful even as you give through e tithes you know, very easily it's a click of a button. <laughs> I hope even right now you can spend that time to meditate whether my giving has been by faith and give it to the Lord in faith, believing. If the Lord prompts you, the, uh, the tithes box um, will be placed in front at the beginning of the service to the end so that if you like to come in early and give your tithes, do that. If you like to take the time right now to give, you can move forward and give the tithes or at the end of it, it's fine. I think God looks at our heart. So let me just give you about two to three minutes to just reflect upon the text that we have just read. Our offering has to be a faith-filled word offering.
Father, we just give thanks to the Lord for all that has been given and collected. Father Lord, we thank you. All things come from you, through you, and it's for you. For that blessing, God, of the material dreams, we return all, in fact, back to you for your glory and for your honor. For that, you have given us as stewards. I ask that you help us to be good stewards of every physical, spiritual blessings that when we are blessed, Lord, we can always be a blessing to others also. May the collections this day, O oh God, be used, God, for your kingdom, for your purpose, for your church building, the expansion of your kingdom. We give thanks, God, for everybody who has given. Grant all of us such a cheerful heart because we are filled with gratitude for who you are in our lives. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to move to the segment of our Lord's Supper. I'm going to invite Pastor Shu up. Let's continue in the attitude of worship. If you have a Bible, turn with me. I'd like you to turn your Bible with me. I'm going to read a passage that we seldom just take in segment only, but today I just feel we need to read the whole segment. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to read from verse 17 right to the end, 34, which is 17 verses. If you would just follow along with me. As you take the Lord's Supper, I think it is important for us to remember, we give the tithes and offering. It's a privilege, it's an honour to give back to God what is His. But we need to remember, God gave us His Son as an offering for our sin and guilt. And we are asked to observe this ordinance carefully. And I think we read these verses this morning so to take some extra care that it doesn't become a ritual. It doesn't become a part only, but it is our worship. In verse 17, follow along as he just, as I read to you. In the following directives, Paul writes, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why 
Many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I give you further instructions. Just like to share a few pointers with you here, and I felt that it was necessary to prepare, as I prepare my heart to take the Lord's Supper, each month it's not just me coming here to conduct it or anything. We need to know the essence behind it all. And first and foremost, in the NIV uh, Bible there, it says the Lord's Supper. Some call it the Last Supper. Some call it Communion. I think it is very important as we read here in verse 20 to 23, we call it, it is the Lord's Supper. It tells us, it is the Lord's Supper. We are invited to the Lord's Supper. What a privilege it is. We are the invited people. He has invited us. And he was, this passage was written to members, to disciples of his. We who are believers, even then, are invited to partake of this. Others who do not know the Lord, observe this Lord's Supper. If you are here this morning, you are not, have not received the Lord, but just observe it and understand it. And you are invited to receive the Lord also. After when I explain the significance of it. It is not about exclusion. Or that. It's about inclusion into His love and into His salvation. Remember that very, very clearly. And then, Another thing in verse 17 to 20, he talks about unity. And these are very stern words, sometimes difficult for us to swallow. But one of the words that we use very often for the Lord's Supper, and we should reflect upon it quite often, is that it's actually a love feast. A love feast. Where all the people sitting together love the Lord Jesus and they love one another. And the passage explained to us why Paul couldn't right, say that he will give praise because there were some, and he said he believed to some extent, this unity. We need to remember it's a love feast. We need to examine all right, that we are of the right attitude. That's basically it. And at the lower part, it says that again. Examine our attitude. Examine ourselves. See if what we are doing, the way we behave is honouring and glorifying to God. We need to remember that as we take off the Lord's Supper. And if necessary, he didn't say definitely everybody is guilty of it or he didn't, that's not the crux of it. And he says, if today my action, my attitude, even as I step in, is needed all right, to help in unity, and then I need to uh, examine myself and make adjustment. Make adjustment. Make confession and repentance. And as we do that, you know, uh, uh, He will straight away forgive us. It tells about our confession is needed before we even take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And finally, Sometimes, like in this case here, it's like, it is so solemn. But we need to remember it's not a funeral. It's a memorial. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Funeral, we do it and the person is dead and it's gone forever. Memorial is quite a different thing in this case here, especially the Lord's Supper. It is talking about His resurrection. It's talking about Him freeing us. He's talking about He's coming back for us a second time. That's why he said, as long, as often as we take this, we proclaim His resurrection and His coming back again. 
That's important. And we take it as a family. Here, I just very quickly want to put in before we break the bread together and take the cup together, that this is done as a family. And that's why Paul writes, some of you might as well eat at home. And some of you get drunk and all this. It's not meant to be taken by an individual just by himself or herself. It is to be taken together as a family, like in a worship. And that's why Paul writes here, read this passage carefully. That when you come together, when you come together, and we want to stick as close to the Bible as possible so that it doesn't become a ritual. Because sometimes, after years of being Christian, observing it, it's so easy for us to take the bread, take the cup, and just get a little bit of the main gist, but we forget the final one. Things like unity. Things like confession and repentance that it is available only in the Lord Jesus. Things like we are proclaiming the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loved us. He offered Himself. He died for us. That's why He died on the cross. That's why He come. And that's what all the bread and the cup represents. And I started off by saying, we are not excluding people. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, may you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. His love for you. The extent of it for you how He died on the cross. And that is by grace we are saved, not because of good work. So let's take a moment as you close your eyes and just tell yourself to go through this passage again, maybe at the end of today or maybe even during the week, once again, to understand what a privilege it is to be God's children. What a privilege it is to live in unity and become a witness for Him to the kingdom of God. And for us, maybe some of us need to make adjustment to align our life with Him. Things like, I've never thought about the love of Jesus Christ, that He loved me so much, I want to trust Him. Would you close your eyes and just take a few minutes Father, thank you for your love for the whole world. Thank you for the demonstration, for the evidence of sending your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to the cross to die for every single person and to offer it as a free gift to offer it by grace, not earn or in any manner at all for us. And we who are saved, thank you for this privilege to be called your sons and your daughters. We stand together. We choose to stand together that the world might know your love because of the way we love one another. You break the bread, recognizing you died on the cross for our sin, you who is without sin. And we take the cup, recognizing the power of the cross, that it is broken death, defeated death, and that we can live in the newness of life. This we take in remembrance of your work, the powerful work that you have done and is still at work today. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen.
body and the cup. Just give us a heart of humility as we hear your message to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just want to say a very good morning to all of you. It's um, with such gladness to be able to join you back in worship. Um, last Sunday was fairly special, just to be isolated, um, but to the glory and the grace of God, um, I'm, I'm recovered. And this week, when I went for my uh, subsequent checkup with the specialist, I've given it all cleared. So the blood in my urine has be, has cleared. Uh, there's some little minor thing to follow up, but I'm just trusting the Lord to. Uh, watch over us and uh, God is good all the time sometimes regardless even my sincere prayer is that I'll be cleared but even when challenges comes when there are things don't go our way God is always good to all of us amen we live in a society I realize that titles matters isn't it uh, in today's context we don't call somebody who manages the dead person as a undertaker what do we call them today funeral director wow. in the week that i had i catch up with i mean one of the series that i'm glad chinese music put up was this thing about this uh, um, series on the prison and i don't know whether you caught some of it it's a very meaningful series that they interview uh, with uh, prisoners to understand their feelings and the process that they go through and no longer they call the prison officers uh, prison officers, their branding now is called they are captains of lives. I love it. <laughs> Likewise, we don't just we don't call somebody who stays at home, sacrifice their career to take care of the family and the house now as housewife, or for that matter, house husband. Now we call them homemaker. Right? And better, I suggest husband, you call your wife to stay home as minister of home affairs. La. Don't you like it? And then sometimes they become ministers of finance also. Whatever. We live in a society where titles matters, and I want to suggest to you, titles do matter. By and large, because of the title that we have on ourselves, that determines the things that we engage in and how we do things. If you see yourself as a homemaker, you are preoccupied as what a homemaker does. And as, a, as an educator then, I put myself professionally as to what an educator does to teach, to impact lives. Paul in the Bible and many other disciples had a title that probably not many of us would like to have it. Give me a guess, please. Paul took on a title. In fact, he saw himself in this title and God gave him this title. Do you know what title was that? Servant. Thank you. I heard some of you. Paul, as we have been studying the book of Ephesians and many other openings in his letters, Paul would call himself a servant of Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 6 4, he calls himself a servant of God. And in other letters, he calls himself even a servant of the gospel. And because Paul saw himself as a servant of God, and the servant of the gospel, you and I must know that it determined the way he does things, the way he acted, and the things that he engaged in. I think we have studied enough about Paul in our letter of Ephesians to know that he was utterly devoted to serve God and the gospel, even though it caused him incomparable sufferings, even to the point of martyrdom. Dear brothers and sisters, fellow fishers of men, followers of Jesus Christ, 
I want to suggest to us as we think about this passage in Ephesians 3 this morning, and as in the life of Paul, kingdom servanthood is perhaps what we need to imitate most today. And I suggest that because that is who Jesus is. If we are true followers of Jesus, we do what Jesus does. The scripture will tell us that Jesus says of himself that I came not to be served, but to serve. And he gave his life for a ransom for many. So people, the questions that we must ask ourselves this morning is, what is Paul or what are the many others secret to this kingdom servanthood? Obviously, it doesn't come by an instant. There must be a process that has brought Paul to serve God like that. What was Paul's secret to that victory against pride that all of us can have that can derail us from a spirit of servanthood? What is Paul's secret to give him a tremendous perseverance and joy to keep serving God amidst his challenging circumstances. I think that is that relevance for all of us in today's context too, to serve God wholeheartedly until the end. So in Ephesians 3, turn your Bible with me to Ephesians 3 verse 7 to 9, as Paul continues to explain his ministry and his calling to his beloved, the Christians in, in Ephesus, we will see three keys to Paul's kingdom servanthood. And I want to invite Uncle Kai to come forward to read that text for us. Uncle Kai, please. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administrations of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Thank you, Uncle Kai. Let's pray together and commit this time again to the Lord. Father Lord, tutor our hearts afresh. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Lord, be pleasing as unto you. That the words that will be shared, Lord, bring forth an intent, the purpose of your intent, God, for your kingdom purpose, O God. And let those words that is useless be scattered far away. They will be of no use. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three keys to Paul's kingdom servanthood. It's not just service. It is a kingdom servanthood serving the king. Let us go through that one by one. In verse 7, Scripture says, Paul says of himself, I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Question, what exactly was this gift of God's grace that was given to Paul? Come on, engagement, huh? It is, I think you and I are thinking the same thing, the gift of a salvation through Jesus Christ. Paul clearly recognizes that he is now a servant of God and a servant of gospel because of God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And I want to suggest to all of us the first key and the fundamental thing about kingdom servanthood is about a gospel gratitude. It's about a gospel gratitude. Paul was deeply grateful to God's gift of salvation. He was deeply grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the good news of Jesus Christ coming to provide forgiveness of sins for all who will believe in Him. Paul is one who is deeply grateful because when he placed his faith in Jesus, God forgave all his sins, God lifted up his guilt, and God changed his life purpose and life destiny altogether. It is this gospel gratitude that led Paul to serve God and his gospel wholeheartedly 
unreasonable. Unreasonable. Allow me to share a quick story as we have picked up in Church Retreat A. His story, Paul's story and his encounter, and this whole text is found in Acts chapter 9, so that you may embrace the grace and the mercy of God in a life like Paul and for all of us. Before Paul became a Christian, he was a member of the Pharisee. He was a very educated man. He studied under the most eminent Jewish teacher by the name Gamaliel. So he knew Judaism thoroughly true and true. And so when Christ came into the picture, Paul saw then, saw Christianity as a threat to his truth. And he saw Jesus Christ as the blasphemer. So he decided to make it his core and his purpose to put an end to this whole thing about Christianity, followers of Jesus. He breathed threats against those who followed Jesus, and he was also present, and he was the one that consented to the death of Stephen. Now, by the grace of God, an amazing thing happened when Saul was on his way to Damascus, that is recorded in Acts chapter 9. They'll do that on your own private Bible study. It records that Paul encountered a blinding bright light, and he fell to his ground, and he heard Jesus spoke to him. In Galatians 1 verse 16, God revealed his son Jesus to him. Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 1, Paul says that he saw the Lord. And after this encounter with God, Paul was led by the hand blind to Damascus, where he met a Christian named Ananias. And then and there he was cured of his blindness. He put his faith in Jesus, he believed in Jesus, and then he was baptized. That changed a man's destiny and purpose altogether. What a tremendous testimony of the grace and the mercy of God. Paul will go on in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, explicitly saying, reminding us too, that you and I, we thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength that he would consider me trustworthy appointed me to his service. It's a privilege. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor with a violent, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Verse 14, the grace of God was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul deeply appreciated God's salvation in his life and that changed his life purpose and destiny altogether. Gospel gratitude. Gospel gratitude. I want to share a principle with you for you to reflect on. A servant of God is filled with that deep sense of gospel gratitude because of God's salvation in his or her life. You and I who have believed in our Lord Jesus Christ must be filled with a gratitude for the gospel. And no wonder as we have done in Ephesians 1 and 2, Paul took so much effort to remind the Christians of the state they were in, a hopeless state, a dead state, and how Christ has brought them into a glorious state with every spiritual blessing now in Christ Jesus. Wow, the grace and the mercy of God. So as some thoughts for reflection and application, our lives may not be as dramatic, I believe, most of us, or maybe you want to put it as bad as Paul. But that defeats the point because surely you and I have at one point or another did things that we are not proud of. Obviously, at one point, you and I have rejected the love of God in our lives. We have, I have done things that we know is wrong and we know we have sinned. And the Bible would clearly say that all have sinned. Let's put everyone on the same platform. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans will go on to say the consequence of our sin is a separation with God, the Bible says, is death and eternal separation. And that is why we have heard earlier on 
the intervention, the solution, the love of God, the mercy of God upon us is through Jesus Christ that He came and He provided forgiveness of sin by dying, taking on our death on the cross. This morning, if you like to believe in Jesus or simply want to learn more about what was shared, I want to encourage you to speak to a friend who has brought you here this morning or any of us at the end of today's service. But for the majority of us who have believed in Jesus Christ, are we deeply grateful to the gospel and to Christ's salvation of your life and mine? As we recall and wrote down our own story, three segments, our lives before we encountered Christ during the retreat, our lives when we have encountered Christ, how we encountered Christ, and our life after we encountered Christ, will you remember that exercise and be deeply grateful for the gospel that has transformed our lives? Then, what changes are needed perhaps in the way that we live and the things that we do to reflect this gospel gratitude to Jesus, our Lord and Saviour? I suggest specifically serving yourself and serving your sinful desires, serving money, material things, certainly do not reflect a deep gratitude to your Lord and Saviour. Will you be a servant of Jesus Christ to serve Him alone? Exodus 20 will remind us, you shall have no other gods before me. Prior to that, God will say, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. It's a gospel gratitude. So would you be a servant of the gospel by living it out and sharing with others your faith? The second key, I believe, to Paul's kingdom servanthood beyond kingdom's gratitude is a kingdom humility. In that verse that I've read in verse 7, he says that it is the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. And I move on to verse 8. Although I am the less than the least of all the lost people, bearing in mind this full Paul, the person who is saying this is Paul, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Notice two things in these verses. Number one, Paul's emphasis is not just on the grace, which means unmerited favour. It is not just that gift that he's talking about. It is a grace that was given by God. It is an emphasis that this grace is a gift given by God. In other words, Paul was deeply aware and humbled to serve God is a privilege given by God. It's a wonderful privilege, it's a favour of God for you and I to be able to serve Him. Neither Paul deserved it, none of us deserve it. And the second thing to notice, to add on to that, he says that it's not just that gift that was given to me. Verse 7 says, it is true, the working of His power. Wow! It is not just a gift that I've received, it is the power of the Holy Spirit that has been working in my life to convict me of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment that I may believe and receive this gift of grace. If that's the case, there are only two huge implications as we serve God. I suggest to you there is nothing, not something to be boasting about. Because to serve Jesus and to serve the gospel, as I said, is a privilege given by God. And it's not just that it is because of the power of God working in me to believe, to will and to act. Therefore, it is not something to be boasted about. It is given, it is not given because of my merits or my ability. So we are totally dependent on God even now as we serve Him. And we serve the gospel in every ministry 
God is pleased us in. Paul himself says, who is sufficient, who will be competent and adequate for the ministry of reconciliation? And the answer is obvious, no one. It's the gospel humility. The second huge implication I want you to know, because it is a gift from God to serve Him, this privilege is a high and a holy calling of God. Think with me for a short while. It is a privilege given by God today to serve Him. It is a title, it is a call of God to serve Him. And if it is a call from our God, I want all of us to remember it's a high and a holy calling. You were set apart for that purpose. To be more specific, children of God this morning, to serve God is not a secondary calling that we do only when we have time. It is the primary calling you can say it is almost the first calling from the fact and the moment we come to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not a secondary calling. It is a calling that you must, you will give time and commitment as you would to many other responsibilities at work or even at home. So I want to suggest that it is this gospel humility that led Paul to serve God wholeheartedly. And I've just briefly highlighted, it is Paul himself who says, and look at that humility, although I am the less than the least of all the Lord's people, it is enough to say I'm the least of all people. Look at the language that he's using here. I am the less of the least. In other words, he always understands and sees himself as an unworthy servant, yet it is the grace of God that has called me into this kingdom to serve God and the gospel and to preach the gospel. Oh my, Christians today, sometimes we look at people's weaknesses with the illumined eye greater than we see in ourselves, the wickedness within us. And we forget the grace and the mercy of God that has saved you and I. Is there anything to boast when it has always been the work of God? I share with you the second principle. Therefore, a servant of God is filled with a deep sense of gospel humility because of God's gift of grace and you know that salvation through His power. A servant of God is filled with a deep sense of gospel humility because of God's gift of grace through His power. You and I need to come to that place in our lives to realize to serve God is a privilege given by God. We are only unworthy servants. One of the most impactful and i'm thankful for all of you who've been praying for me in that journey leading to uh, full-time calling but one of the word that has stuck deep in my heart and i know god is speaking and how the word always speaks and root us root, root us in his scripture leading up to my pastoral installation is taken from luke 17 verse 10 may i remember and may i share that with an encouragement to all of you jesus himself would say referring to me when you have done everything you were told should say we are unworthy servants we have only done our duty wow i hope i will remember this faithfully as i serve the church as i serve god and the gospel we have only done everything that we were told we should only say i'm unworthy servant i've only done my duty so it's all about god's grace and his mercy his redemption his transformation as an application, I want to urge all of us to serve the Lord in humility. Always give God the glory. Humility is glad when God gets all the credit for calling us to serve Him according to His will. 
and then people serve one another humbly. Serve one another humbly. We are family to one another. Serve one another humbly. Humility gets us down low and lifts others up. Humility looks to the needs of others and gives time and effort to help those who are in need. And I commend all of you because I've seen evidences of that in the way that you are serving one another. Seen or unseen, your service reveals that humility. The second, the two keys that I've shared to kingdom servanthood, first and foremost, a gospel gratitude, second of which, a gospel humility. The third that I see in Paul's life is a gospel courage. It's a gospel courage. Verse 8, look at the call and the ministry of Paul. As he says that he being the least of all people, this was the call and this was the grace, the privilege given to him, which is to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which we have learned before, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. I believe the third key to Paul's kingdom servanthood is a gospel courage. It is a lead up to me to the first two keys. First and foremost, a gratitude. Second of which is a humility that I'm a servant of the Lord. It doesn't end down there. It moves forth from the heart, a gratitude, to the action, to a courage within it's a gospel courage. It's the courage to preach the gospel to all men, even though it might not be received well. Gospel courage is standing up for the truth in front of the authorities, the kings, the Romans, the Jews, the emperor of Rome, etc. and etc. and would not compromise with God's word, even when faced with persecution. Gospel courage. You and I would know that Paul was tasked to preach this mystery that through Christ, both the Jews and the Gentiles would be reconciled as one. You and I would have learned before that this obviously does not sit in well with the Jewish people. Yet, Paul, courage, gospel courage, led him to preach the gospel regardless. Paul courageously shared the gospel, I want you to know because the master God said so. And that's what servants do. What the Lord says, we do. Where the Lord calls, we go. That's something I believe we must pick up from Paul's kingdom servanthood, Paul's obedience to the master. Whoever he sends me to, I will go. Whatever he wants me to say, I must say. Gospel courage comes from a conviction in Paul's own writing, Romans 1 verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. It is the power of God that brings salvation. I believe this power, this conviction comes from two very simple things. Know God and know His Word. Know God is rooted in the knowledge of God and in His Word. Paul would share courageously because he knew God intimately and he took God's Word as true and as the authority. It was not as if always that sacred special voice, Roy, I'm calling you to. It is the authority of God's word as real as God speaking to me. And if it's instructed, I must do so. If God has says in Matthew that go and make disciples of all nations, it is the word of God that we must obey immediately, willingly and gladly. Paul understood, knew the one who called him as the Lord God Almighty. So no matter what the situation, Paul was confident that God would watch over him. He is the shade at my right hand that the sun will not harm me by day nor the moon by night. This confidence allowed 
call to serve courageously and endure any challenge. The third principle a servant of God is filled with a deep sense of gospel courage because of the one who instructs us, God Almighty, and because of the word of God that tells us so. A servant of God is filled with a deep sense of gospel courage because of the one who instructs us and because of his word, his promises. Today, you and I, I must say, also preach a gospel of sin, repentance, and of course, salvation that may not sit well with many. Nobody likes to be corrected, exposed to the reality of the sick condition that they are all in. We likewise. It doesn't sit in well, but that's the good news of the gospel. Yet as servants of the Lord, would you be courageous to share the gospel to anyone that the Lord is leading you through today? I record, we wrote down two to three names, kings, family, community, friends during our church retreat that the Lord has placed upon your heart that you will be intentional in praying to care for and to share the gospel. I want to encourage all of us to continue to pray, to care, and to ask for that opportunity to share the gospel with them. Perhaps some of us, as we enter back to our families, to our workplace, we need to stand up for the truth of the gospel in front of our family members, the truth of the gospel in front of our bosses, and I will not compromise with God's word even when it means possible persecution and ridicule. The third key to Paul's kingdom humility, kingdom servanthood, I believe is rooted also in that gospel courage. So all in all, may I summarize the call this morning for us as followers of Jesus, fishers of men, is to imitate Paul's kingdom servanthood, Christ's servanthood, who came to serve and not to be served. Our primary calling today servants of God, is to be devoted to serving God and the gospel only. Remember this commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in the heavens above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, and a jealous God, punishing the sins of the parents, the children of the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation, but showing love to a thousand generation of those who love me, who will serve me. Very simple secrets, deep, profound, but yet it is because of the gospel. Therefore, root yourself in that gospel gratitude because of God's salvation in your life, Consider the gospel humility because it is God's gift of grace and that is His power in us. It is a gospel courage because of the one who instructs us and His word. As I've started, I'm going to end. For some of us, if it is your desire to receive God's salvation in your life by believing and repenting from your sins and mine likewise, I want you to make a decision this morning to believe. I want to encourage you to do that by speaking to any one of us. The friend that has brought you says, I'm so keen to believe in you. Let me know. I'd like to pray with you at the end of this service if that's among us. The challenge for the rest of us as believers, followers of Jesus, you've got to be deeply grateful 
consider the gospel that has transformed our lives and therefore make the necessary changes in your life and the things that you engage in to reflect this gospel gratitude to Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. To us, let us serve the Lord in humility, always give God the glory, let us serve one another in love, and last but not least, be courageous in sharing the gospel, even though it might not sit well with others, because of the one who calls you. Continue to pray, to care, and to ask for opportunity to share the gospel with them. Let me pray for all of us. Thank you for that living example of not just Jesus Christ, but the life of Paul that has demonstrated for us what it means to serve you, God, and the gospel. And in all honesty, we are far from that you have intended, but yet it is not just a something that we could do. We are asking right now, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us, to revive our souls, that we can recognize, God, the depth of your love for all of us on that cross the change that you have made in our life, in our destiny, in our purpose, and there birth forth, O oh God, a gratitude for all that we are right now in you. And grant all of us also, God, a humility because it has never been even any of our good works nor merits, but it is a gift from you. And therefore, we count it a privilege and a high calling to serve you, Lord God Almighty and to serve the gospel. And last but not least, O oh God, it is this gospel courage that I'm praying for us as we send us out. As I know, God, the impetus, the things that's upon your heart is to send us out, Lord, to be a gospel barrier through our life testimony, through our story that you are continuously writing. Help us, God, to be testifying to the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God in Jesus Christ through our lives. That is also for the lives of people who have not yet to know you. Send us off, God, with that power and courage that comes from you because all authority belongs and comes from you, O oh God. I give thanks again, God, for this word, even as we stand, as we meditate and respond. Would you hear the heart's cry of your people? Minister to us and move us, God, out where we are, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with me. We will